Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for Las Musas live webinar. Um, I'm Natalia Sylvester, and I'm here with Chantel Acevedo. And we're just so excited to be talking to you all about um, this transition from writing uh, from writing for adult an adult audience to a kid lit audience. And in our cases, that includes middle grade and YA. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I, I wanted to like, Chantel, why don't you go ahead and tell us about your books? Yes, hi Natalia, so good Hello. to see you and, and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, Natalia, it's not, this is Natalia's uh, brainchild. She had this terrific idea to host this webinar on this topic. And so she and I do have this in common. We have a couple of other things in common too, but um, we have definitely this in common that we both started our careers writing for adults and, and sort of made this sort of a, a shift to writing for kids, though I'm sure we'll both also continue to write for adults as well. Um, and so it's um, it's been an interesting journey. So I'll, I guess I'll talk briefly about my books. I've written um, several books for adults. The most recent two were published by Europa Editions, and um, that would be the Distant Marvels, which I have handy here. Just to my Europa editor will be so pleased <laughs> that I'm sharing that. And then in 2017, uh, The Living Infinite, and both are historical fiction set in Cuba. Um, which is my heritage. Um, but after those books, I um, I have kids. I have a 14-year-old and an eight-year-old, and they were always asking, when are you gonna write one for us, mom? And so the idea for Muse Squad, the Cassandra Curse was born. And so this is this book is coming out with Balzer and Bray in July. So it's July 7th is my pub date. And it's about four girls who are muses, sort of the ancient Greek muses, except they're not Greek, they're sort of global girls. They come from all over. And our protagonist is uh, Callie Martinez Silva, and she's a Cuban American girl from Miami. And we follow her specifically, it's from her point of view. And she discovers that she is amused when she accidentally turns her best friend into a pop star. Um, so we follow her. Oh, I love that, that adventure. Yeah. How about you, Natalia? Tell us about your books. Uh, yeah, so I uh, my my debut novel is Chasing the Sun. It came out in 2014, and um, this my second novel, also for adults, is Everyone Knows You Go Home. And around the time I started, actually around the time Everyone Knows You Go Home sold, um, it was 2016. You know, right in the middle of the elections, and I was I remember watching a lot of the campaign footage and. Um, Noticing, uh, for some reason, I just became really intrigued, not by the um, candidates themselves, but usually by their family members who were always like standing behind them in some way or fashion. And one day I noticed that there was a senator who had a teenage daughter standing behind him. And I just couldn't stop wondering, like, what must that be like to be a teenager and um, have your father be running for president? And so that's really where the story, um, the idea for running came out. And I started writing this book and it evolved into this story about a Cuban American teenager whose father is running for Senate. And um, throughout the course of the campaign, all these things happen that make her realize that he's really not the man that she's always thought he is. Like it, the campaign brings like an intense level of scrutiny to her life. Um, it exposes this, um, uh, an environmental and public health crisis that makes her realize that maybe her father's at the center of it all. And so, it's this strange kind of juxtaposition in which she's finally finding her voice and realizing what she believes in um, right at a time when it's actually in opposition to her father's views. And um, she has to decide if she is going to be able to speak out against him while the whole country's watching. So yeah, those are our books. And I, yeah, I'm excited for us to talk about the journeys here. Um, but I guess before we do that, I wanted to, I know we have some people in the chat and I just wanted to see like where everyone is coming from, tuning in from. I know oh, Mia's here, Maria, oh, look, Sheila from Charlotte. Yes. Yay, this is really great. I see a Mariam, Ma Mariam, that's my middle name. So yeah. my Tokaya. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, middle name Tokaya. That's awesome. Yes. Yeah, so throughout the, th throughout the webinar today, if you all have any questions, you know, please go ahead and ask them. And if we don't answer them all right away, we'll definitely get to them um, by the end of the um, conversation. But we definitely are open to questions along the way because we do want this to be like a real time conversation. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah. Um, ooh, okay, so with that said. <laughs> yeah, 
I want to point out too that there's another button there for offers. And so um, Natalia and I will just toggle back and forth between the pre-order links for our books. But that link will take you to Books and Books, which is our local indie bookstore here in Miami. And um, like all indie bookstores, they are working hard to uh, keep putting books in people's hands and also trying to stay afloat in these hard times and books and books is offering free shipping um, mm -hmm. nationwide as well so please if you're going to order books support your indies so we'll mm -hmm. toggle between those two offers yeah that's true and actually both of our books are coming out in july so if you order them now you can you'll be pre-ordering them but you'll still get the free shipping so that's kind of awesome because you're also helping support the, the bookstore right now so yes, yes, yes. Cool. so so, um, Shantek, tell me a little mm -hmm. bit about like how this, like, how did you first come to um, to make this transition? Like, what what sparked yeah. it all? Well, like I said, it was mainly talking to to my kids about it. But it, it's I was an English teacher at an, a high school English teacher for nine years, um, and so that it, it was always something that interested me in writing for kids and they used in YA and middle grade books are books that I never stopped reading even though I stopped teaching at that age you know level even though I had transitioned to, to teaching for, to college students um, and so I've I'd always been reading um, in that in that field and was just really really compelled to, to write story stories for kids for teenagers and pre-teenagers specifically um, I love them. I love how enthusiastic they can be and how passionate they can be, which is what I love about your character, Mari, right? Who <laughs> sees a problem and wants to make a change. And I think the great, the great um, irony with kids is that they can have all of this passion, but very little power in the world, right? Because of their age, because of their right. circumstance, because of, you know, laws. Yeah, <laughs> um, totally. And so ex exploring that, that, that tension, right? I, I, I see the world idealistically and, and I want to make a difference. And, and how do I do it? Yeah. In my book specifically, it's sort of a magical kind of portal. Also, it's middle grade. And so it, it's, it's a little bit different in terms of mm -hmm. what um, the characters can do. But I, um, I, just, I just really liked exploring that approach to problem solving that kids yeah. have that's so different from the way adults approach problem solving. Yeah. So yeah. I love that you? you bring up. Um, I love that you bring up like loving kids and oh look, my dog just came into my lap in case she pops up. Um, <laughs> no, I love that. No, okay, no. <laughs> uh, I was thinking like I love how you brought up um, that you know how much of your reading life was you know was um, mm. in, in kid lit and also that it, it came from a love of of kids too because I do think one of the funny things is when. Um, when I first, uh, my book deal for running came out, I, a lot of people said to me, they're like, oh my God, that's so great because you're gonna make so much money. You're gonna make so much more money with writing for young adults. And I thought that was such an interesting thing to say because I thought, well, first of all, like who knows if that is the case, you know, because all of, all, no, nothing in publishing is actually guaranteed. But I just thought, well, that would be like probably the wrong reason to do it. Yeah. Um, because I do think it has to be born of this love of, the literature and a love of the audience, you know, mm -hmm. and a real genuine, um, you know, desire to, and, and like a sense of caring for them, you know, mm -hmm. and really wanting to speak to them. And I think like for me, that's really what, even though I didn't realize that I was running away, I actually sent the first few pages of running mm -hmm. to my agent and she's like, I love this, but mm -hmm. she's like, you know, it's YA, right? right? And I just thought that's really interesting because a, like my reading life was like very much, like I, I, I try to read very diversely, but I certainly go through phases where I'm probably reading more adult books or I'm reading more YA books or, I'm, you know. And so during that time in my life, like the last two or three years, the majority of what I'd been reading had been YA. Mm. And when I thought of this story, even though I hadn't written it, like knowing that I was doing this, but I definitely realized that when I'm when I was writing, I wasn't writing for the adults in the book. Mm -hmm. I was writing for other people like Maddie, yeah. you know, yeah. who might be kind of going through that struggle. Um, and like, and the, like what you said, that 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 feeling of powerlessness, even though there's so much you want to do. Mm -hmm. I see Mia has uh, come in with a question, which you kind of partly answered, Natalia. And Mia's question is: Are there any misconceptions you think people have about writing for this audience? Oh, yeah. And certainly one of them is the financial aspect of it, right? Mm -hmm. Like, oh, you must be raking it in now, um, which is, is also not true, right? Hardcover books and kid lit are cheaper 
than yeah. hardcore books and adult, right? There's all these kinds of reasons why it's not it's not true. But um, I think one of the misconceptions that you know I hear is, um, well, you're dumbing down the work. Oh, you're God, just so you're true. just, <laughs> you're just <laughs> dumbing it down. Yeah. And it, it's it's been fascinating to me writing all the things that I've learned in this process of mm -hmm. writing in sort of the middle grade space and working with my terrific editor, who is Kristen Renz at Balsam and Bray. She's a fantastic editor. And one of the things, one of the notes I remember getting early on was, walk me through the thought process. Walk me through the thought process or walk me through the points of decision making, right? Mm -hmm. Because an adult lit you off, I mean, we are sort of, it's sort of hammered home in our workshops, right? Show, don't tell, show, don't yeah. tell. Because, you know, the reader, the reader knows. The reader knows just via action. And of course, kids know via action too, but because they are in a different stage of their reading life, right? Things need to be just a touch more explicit. That's not dumbing down. That's no. a skill I had to learn. I had to unlearn a lot <laughs> and then yeah. learn a lot, right? And how do you slow down the thinking process and at the same time maintain the voice? Yeah. His voice is so crucial. Like, how do you keep both those things happening at the same time? So there's no dumbing down at all. I feel like I've learned and stretched and grown a lot. So that's one. Mm. That's yeah. one. I agree. I and I think at the same time, even though the it almost feels um, adding to like that difficulty of it is that you're also looking at efficiency of story, right? Because we have like less words to work with generally. Mm -hmm. You know, I think my first adult book was something like 90,000 words. Um, or both of them actually clocked in at around that much. And then um, running is in the 60s, I think, mm -hmm. you know? And and I remember when I first sent the completed draft to my agent, she was like, yeah, let's let's shoot for at least 10,000 words less. Uh, and mm -hmm. it was just such an important lesson. And, you know, how do I keep um, the the story moving forward? Um, and and in a way that I'm, I'm, you know, I'm getting to everything not to say that it has to be more quick, you know, but it just, it, you, you don't necessarily have, um, you know, the same actual space on the page. So you have to be mm -hmm. so much more efficient with every yeah. scene and word and mm -hmm. sentence. Absolutely. Um, right. Yeah. We've got lots of good questions. Yeah. Hello. Do you want to pick the next one? Oh yeah. Oh wow. Okay. So it's funny. I wasn't seeing any of these questions cause I was yeah. scrolling all the way down and this actually yeah. needs you to scroll up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Let's see. Well, were your agents open to supporting your switch? Mm -hmm. to, Sheila wants to know if we, if they were supportive in yes. um, our switch to young adult and middle grade novels. Mm -hmm. So my agent was, I, I, I've had a number of agents, which um, sounds scary for people who are just starting out, but I think it's pretty typical in an author's career to, to, to sort of change agents as your, um, as your career grows. So when I wrote The Distant Marbles, I switched uh, agents and my agent is Stephanie Abu, who I adore and she's with Lippincott. She's with Massey McCulkin. And um, I remember, and she, we have kids the same age and she has daughters too. And I remember sort of pitching it to her, right? I had this idea for this 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 girl who finds out she's a muse. And I had I had pretty much written all of it because I wasn't sure, you know, like I wasn't, I wasn't sure that that she would be super into it. But I knew I knew she'd be kind no matter what. So I'd, I'd mainly written it. And I was like, I pitched the idea and she said, I love it, send it to me. And so then I, I sent it to her. Um, and what's been actually really cute was that she had her daughter read it and her daughter was my first reader. Hi. And she sent me this really sweet review. That's awesome. I, but yeah, but I, I, I purposely went with Stephanie mm -hmm. because of the, the breadth of what she does and because of her interests. And when we had that first sort of magical agent writer conversation. I talked to her about this this interest and I didn't know if I would ever do it, just I kind of liked the idea of it and she was she was very pleased uh, to hear that. So I didn't I didn't feel any pushback, but I can yeah. imagine some agents wouldn't be comfortable cuz they don't if you know, they don't represent that there might be, but in like yeah. like you I actually also have had two agents. So mm -hmm. um, my first agent who who helped, you know, who sold um, chasing the sun. Um, that was my first agent. And then when it came time to sell Everyone Knows You Go Home, I switched agents because um, my first agent and I just weren't just we weren't on the same page in terms of the creative vision for this mm -hmm. book. So it turned out to be actually really lucky because my new agent or now it's been a few years that I've been yeah. with her. But um, I'm with Laura Dale at the Laura Dale Literary Agency. And um, she works in both YA and adult novels. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it was and it wasn't something I knew that at the time I switched to her, I didn't know that why it was in my future. So mm -hmm. I think I got really lucky in that regard. And I think that's part of why she was 
also so quick to start that conversation of, hey, like, you know, this is YA, right? Because it was, you know, she she works in both. So it was very, um, she was very in tune to like, to that, to the kind of voice and story that I was already starting to write as a, and how it differed from what I've been doing previously. Um, and it was just really wonderful. She was super supportive from the beginning. Um, and and that's what is I, that's become really important to me because, like you said, I think both of us really do plan on writing both, you know, both mm -hmm. kidlit and adult books in right. the future. So yeah, yeah, yeah. My agent, in fact, sent me an email. We, we um, were chatting, and she sent me an email that was like, "So let's talk on Monday. Like, what are, what's next? Kidlit, adult? What's next?" I was like, <laughs> oh, the pressure. I know. <laughs> what is next? I don't know. We're in a pandemic. I know. Um, <laughs> yeah. But you know, I do, I have heard of authors who have had to get different agents yeah, for different books. So yeah. let's say you're, um, if let's, mm -hmm. if you, you know, if you have an agent who represented an adult book and, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and not even, um, and it, it doesn't just have to be different audiences, you know, because young YA or middle grade, you know, mm -hmm. they're not, genres like that is another misconception right they're not genres it's a category it's a different audience right. but right. genres are things like saying you know romance science fiction fantasy contemporary mm -hmm. and things like that and so mm -hmm. um but there are you know sometimes what it, perhaps an agent represents both young adult mm -hmm. and um adult books but what if it's in a different genre so right. you know right. you might want to, like let's say if your first novel was a literary novel and um your second was a YA, which your agent maybe represents contemporary YA, and has sold a lot of that. But maybe if you're writing science fiction YA, you might just decide that you might, you know, you probably be. And and, and also, most agents are very receptive to that conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they course. want you to be with someone who, um, who can sell that book. Like they're not going to try to sell a book that they don't have um, experience or contacts in. Exactly. So we, shall we jump into the yeah. deep end with some of these? Okay. Um, Agnelli has a really, a really specific, but I think an interesting question, given that we're both, uh, we both have Cuban heritage. I know you're bicultural too, mm -hmm. but we, um, our characters are, are Cuban American. Agnelli writes, is it really a no, a no, no to write a powerful, tough topic middle grade in which the protagonist is a Cuban American 14 year old dealing with Me Too issues and machismo of her culture? And so it looks like Agnelli is working on a very interesting book. <laughs> um, I don't think there are sort of, I don't think there are no nos, you know, about, you know, what topics um, a writer can can address in their book and, and yeah. have their characters go through. I think the, the question is how if, if it's a and if it's a 14 year old, that's a very, very upper middle grade or it might be very young YA because mm -hmm. um, there are these sort of great yeah. areas, too, or sort of inter intermediate areas. Um, it just depends on the the voice that you've applied and the perspective that you've applied, right? So, for example, I just turned in Muse Squat Two because it's a it's it's a duology, and in that second book, um, my main character is noticing th some things about her dad. Her parents are divorced, so she spends the summer with her dad in this book, and she realizes that he's kind of that kind of old school Cuban guy who's like, I don't do the dishes. I don't put the baby to bed. You know what I mean? Um, I don't vacuum. And so she starts to talk to her stepmom, like, don't you think maybe Bobby should do those things? <laughs> but it's in, in the way that a 12-year-old a, a, a would just start thinking about these iniquities. You know what I mean? That's totally the age when I started doing that. <laughs> That's right. When you start like, going, wait a minute, mm -hmm. you know? Hmm. You know, that kind of thing. Whereas a 15-year-old or 16-year-old might, might approach that completely differently, mm -hmm. right? Might be angry at, at the stepmom for... Yeah letting it happen you know what i mean and so mm -hmm. i think it's it's about tapping into your your memories of yourself at that particular age and how would you have addressed that that those those issues right so yeah. i don't think it's a no-no it's only a no-no no if you don't sort of capture it right accurately right yeah, yeah and i don't think there should be a no-no for any like I, I think if it's a reality of a of a of a kid's life then there needs to be literature that reflects it and reflects it well and honestly and in a way that will help them process it because otherwise the world can be a really lonely place, right? And I feel like that's the point. That's what books are here for when we don't necessarily have those people in our lives or even um, we if we don't know exactly where to turn to for those conversations, like the books are just a really beautiful place that so many of us first find that kind of um, um, companionship and understanding and, and room to grow and process. So I definitely think that um, I, I would love to read that book. You should totally read it. <laughs> yeah. So, um, 
Yeah. Um, okay, let's see. I do want to talk a little bit about, um, well, oh my goodness, I think it just, okay, am I imagining that I saw a question here? Oh, I thought this was an interesting question from Susan. It's, um, where do you think writing for kids and adults converge and where do you think it diverges? Mm -hmm. um, I think, and I guess for me it goes to, how do I put it? Well, A, I think it's like, so when I write, I try to imagine um, like an ideal reader and I don't mean that in a marketing sense. Mm -hmm. I mean that in a way of like when I was, there have been books that I've read at times in my life where those books have felt like a gift and those books have felt like that they came to me at right at the right time in my life. And um, I like I was meant to read them right then and there and they provided so much more than that story. You know, like they, they just, um, like I said, they feel like a gift. And so I just try to think of like, well, who is that person that I think this book would be a gift for, would mean that much for, mm -hmm. right? And, and I think that is something that uh, because both kids and adults, like, you know, everyone still within the, those um, age ranges is a complete individual. Um, I don't think, I don't see it so much as only being about age. I think it's about like where they are in their lives and like what it is that they need in their lives in that moment. Um, and I know we talked a little bit about um, the craft of it, right? But, um, but yeah, I think from, I think also, at least when I was writing, running, I noticed that it was a story that I also felt I needed to write at that time because I wanted to, like my first two books um, dealt with some really hard topics, um, but they were books that I felt I needed to write. Mm -hmm. And so even though, even when the writing was really hard and it was like kind of um, excavating old wounds, sometimes it felt necessary, right? Running at oftentimes felt just like a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and not only that, but it gave me a lot of hope. Mm -hmm. And it felt like this was something that I wish when I was this age I'd known because I struggled so much as a kid with um, feeling like I could speak up, like whether it was a classroom setting or whether it was, you know, just um, in, in a conversation in which maybe um, I would have to contradict someone and kind of, you know, I like, I, I avoided conflict, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, I think that, like for me, that it, it's more about that. Um, I, I just loved that it. That I think in general, I find most times when I when I read YA, I usually mm -hmm. come come out of it with a little bit more hope and some mm -hmm. sort of um, journey, either of empowerment or having really discovered something, and that just feels good. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's. It, I think it's a really good question, and I think if you gathered all kinds of writers, you'd have, I think, so many different answers mm -hmm. to it. So in the really practical sense, like where it converges, is that you're still exercising the same muscles, yeah. right? You still need solid characters, characters your reader wants to follow. You still need to have a setting. You still need um, to treat that setting in a way that that also evolves along with the character. I mean, all of those things that mm -hmm. you would learn in a, in, a, in a workshop, you know, in school or at a conference that's geared towards adults applies, you know, to children's lit as well. I think in a, in sort of, again, just the craft sense of things, I think there's a, a speed at which children's literature moves, which is quicker, mm -hmm. right? Like things are, the scenes might just be a little bit more compressed, a little bit shorter, and we're getting to, um, to sort of feeling, we're uh, reaching character feeling quickly, right? Like the path yeah. towards it is a little bit more uh, quick uh, than, than you might find in some adult books. But but again, and I think here, Natalia, again, it's one of those things that we have in common. Our adult books would be categorized, for lack of a better word, under sort of literary fiction, yeah. right? So the pace for that would be really slowly. I suspect mm -hmm. if we were like, if we were like crime writers, we'd be like, you know, writing, it would be a fast pace in yeah. an adult book too. So I think it's just, again, it depends on, it's not just apples and oranges, right? No. It's like, Fuji apples and mander, yeah. you know, <laughs> like you're trying to compare like really specific things yeah. here as well. But it, but some of what you said about sort of the feeling of writing it, I think it's true. I, I had more fun writing Muse Squad than I've had writing anything else ever, mm. you know. And, and I'm not sure. Well, one is, you know, I, again, I, I kind of write heavy historical fiction where like, people die, you know, like like stuff yeah. like that. And like this yeah. is like a, a middle grade, and 
I get to tell jokes and there's like a muse of comedy and she's a lot of fun. You know what I mean? And so yeah. that, that is just fun. It's just fun to write it. But I think also there is something about, there's something about having been that age, right? Where you're looking back with fondness, with an awareness of how hard it was, but also the advantage of, of a little bit of wisdom. Mm -hmm. So you kind of know where it's going, right? It's so like you are writing Mari and you know it's going to be okay, right? Yeah. Like if, if you know that if adult Mari could get into a time travel machine, she would go back and hug yeah. young Mari and tell her, you've got this, you know? Right. And so I think there's something um, for the writer who is, who we can't help but embody our characters in many ways. Mm -hmm. There's a kind of sense of, of everything is going to be okay. Yeah. You know? Even in stories think, that might be darker, but still a sense of um, safety, maybe. Yeah. I think, though, even I think that's so interesting because it's so true, but it's also one of the like, it's also mm -hmm. where we can very easily fall into this trap. At least I, I was trying to be very aware of it as I was writing mm -hmm. of even though I am older than Maddie and I've been where mm -hmm. she's been before. I didn't want to in any way minimize um, right. the way she felt because it's very easy for us as time passes to forget mm -hmm. um, how life-changing small things felt right. you know at that age yeah. and um you know how how hard it was when somebody told you you're just being dramatic yeah. or you're making a big deal yeah. out of something that one day you're going to look back and won't matter and so you're you're trying to at least i was like really trying to honor that place that she was at mm -hmm. but also like you said with the wisdom of knowing like where it all fits in her like in 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 the place that she is then, but also where it fits in her whole life as a person mm -hmm. and her growth. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's really something that's, um, that I, again, I think these are the things that make it so it's not just about, like, it's not just like dumbing down a narrative. It's mm -hmm. like, there's, it's, mm -hmm. there's so many nuances involved right. in that. Right. You know? Yeah. I and think, really, and I, I think that danger of, um, you can, you can, you can see it sometimes in, in, in stuff that, um, is not quite ready yet and people are trying to preach to kids mm -hmm. like yeah. that, that kind of preaching tone like this yeah. is what you should have done yeah. right so when i talk about wisdom i'm just talking about sort of the own the writer psychology a little bit oh yeah you know because we've been there but yeah you have to you have to write the character as if they can't see very far ahead because mm -hmm. they can't see very far ahead yeah. and neither could we um which was the struggle yeah. Yeah. It also makes me think of, um, and then the other part of it is that you want to like really capture their voice, but again, mm -hmm. we didn't necessarily grow up at the same time as they did, right? Unless we want to, you know, maybe do, oh goodness, would it be considered historical if I wrote a character who grew up in the 90s? But anyway. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Oh no, don't tell me that. Um, I know, right? But at the same time, yeah, like I, I always thought of, uh, I think of Amy Poehler's character in Mean Girls, and she's like, I'm not a regular mom. I'm a cool mom. And it's like, mm -hmm. that's like the worst thing, you know, like it's so, again, the voice is just really important yeah. to get it right. Um, yeah. So, yeah. When, and you, and it's, it's amazing the things that you have to worry about as well, because I, yeah. I feel like writing, a, writing for kids too, you kind of want to meet them where they are. Mm -hmm. You know, my daughter has been assigned um, books in middle school that were written in the seventies and they were beautiful books, mm -hmm. but they were contemporary of their time. And she's like, what is this? Oh, you know what I mean? Like, like she can't get past some of the things the kids are saying, like right. the slang yeah. you know, or whatever. And, but at that time, right, that book was meeting kids where they are. And I yeah. remember going back and forth with my agent and my editor a lot with the title because it's Muse Squad. I'm like, Squad, mm -hmm. are we still saying Squad? Mm -hmm. Cause, I mean, like you write a thing, you know? Um, I mean, th thankfully, I think kids of a certain age are kind of still saying it. But high school kids will probably turn their nose up at it at this point. Yeah. Like, <laughs> oh, yeah, no. like you worry about, yeah, you you worry about like what's cool and what's not cool anymore. You know? Yeah. Um, I thought the same thing because I, I try, I get, I, I try to not be specific yeah. in certain things. Like, you know, yeah. obviously they're going to text and they're going to have, especially like, you know, we're writing contemporary. So, mm -hmm. um, but I, I try not to like say, um, you know, I put it on Instagram and really more like I post it online mm -hmm. or things like that. But I did, I recently reread Super Fudge. No. Oh, Tales of the Fourth Grade, nothing. Yeah, yeah. I loved those books growing up. Yeah. And I was so fascinated by how timeless it is. Mm. Like, there's just not a huge amount of time markers. Mm -hmm. um, and, like, you know, maybe the mom calls someone, and I know I could picture her having a, you know, having a phone that's connected mm -hmm. to a wall with a cord, but um, really it's just so much, it's just so focused on the relationships. Mm -hmm. And um, and this these small everyday kind of joys and heartbreaks that happen mm -hmm. in Peter's life, 
Mm -hmm. uh, so I just thought it was just such a great example of a book that um, surpasses, you know, yeah. yeah. And some things you can't predict. So my, my yeah. youngest is of the age to be reading Junie B. Jones, like these terrific, mm -hmm. you know, chapter books, but she's, you know, an anxious kid and she's such a little do-gooder. And that's, you know, and, and kids in school nowadays, one of the sort of a bad word that they're not allowed to say it's, it's stupid. Like if something is stupid or dumb, they, they get, they're not supposed to say this, right? Especially mm -hmm. when it's addressed to a classmate, right? It's okay. like very hurtful. Whereas we may have grown up hearing it all the time. And Junie B. Jones calls everything stupid. <laughs> <laughs> everything is stupid it just gives her so much anxiety to see this kid <laughs> this character calling things stupid she just like is horrified every time Junie says it that yeah. um we've moved on to other books so like you can never predict what is going to be the thing that is yeah. is, is not going to age well you know right yeah, yeah. Well, let's let's um, pick another one I let's pick another one see. i think it's well like i was gonna think um chris wanted to know if there's differences and how you approach structure in adult novels mm. versus kid lit and do you feel more pressure to be more plot driven than a character than mm. character driven for younger audiences mm -hmm. which i think is a really great question um, i personally i feel like I, I mean how do i put it it's not that i felt like i'm i have to be more plot driven than character driven i felt like i had to make sure that the character development is embedded in the plot versus mm -hmm. where when I was writing for adults, I could take a little more time with character development and maybe have it be very internal, but make sure it's still, I, I do often try to mirror um, internal and external. Like those are things mm -hmm. I think about constantly, but I was even more aware of it mm -hmm. with um, with running. And I will say what you said earlier about power also, Shanta, was mm -hmm. so important because especially like writing books, like both of us are writing books set in Miami, right? Mm -hmm. And so I found that really interesting because a lot of the YA books that I've read recently, if you notice, like a lot of the kids have very, um, they have many, like they have a lot more independence in their life and they're living, if they're living in a city that has great public transportation, mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, right? And then, right. you know, in, in my book, like there's, I mean, Miami has public transportation, but it's a different experience there where class comes into it too, mm -hmm. where it's like, I mean, I had my editor who's in New York who at first asked me like, oh, why would this be new to her? You know, right. that why hasn't she written, because there's a scene where she writes the Metro mm -hmm. and she, she wasn't really sure why Maddie wouldn't know exactly how to like, you know, put her card in and all that and stuff. And because then I, I realized, I was like, yeah, this is, you know, because this isn't like New York or LA, you know, or San Francisco. Um, and so these are things that, again, that takes a little bit of power away from her. Like, who does she depend on? There's only so many places she can literally go. So where can the story actually go? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely right. And I remember, I kind of remember you talking about that online yeah. a little bit. And I, I remember it, it really resonated with me because I had just gone on the Metro Rail for something and I hadn't been in like decades. Because again, yeah. it's not that, not that useful. Uh, a train really and so, and I struggled at the machine I was like what now where do I mm. like I did a lot a lot of that you know yeah. Metro is actually in the first chapter of Mew Squad and um mm -hmm. and um it's sort of when something very dramatic happens you know mm -hmm. uh, on the Metro Rail but but again my character's not used to writing it you know like it's yeah. it's not something that she rides and I, and I think also and I think we're getting away from Chris's question but we'll get back to it hi Chris um I think also um like culturally right mm -hmm. yeah so our characters you know the, if they're both cuban american kids they aren't allowed to do things alone yeah <laughs> you know like they just they just aren't and they don't much question it right mm -hmm. like that's the other part of it it's not just oh my very strict cuban parents and i'm so mm -hmm. oppressed it's more like no everyone is like this as are all my friends and i don't even yeah. question the fact that i don't walk around the block by myself right you know, or I don't, I'm, I'm 10 and I don't ride my bike without my grandmother watching me from the front yard. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like that kind of, that kind of, the way we grew up, which was very, we were just very um, observed. Yeah. And so it's, you know? if, I had um, an early reader once ask me, cause I have one, this one character that actually says to Maddie at one point, like, well, your mom's being really cool about this. And my reader was like, but her mom's not being cool about this. And I thought, well, no, she really is. Cause she's normally like much, much more strict. And right. so for her to be slightly strict, is like a big <laughs> deal. Yeah. <laughs> you know? But again, it, it like it, um, I think it ends up telling a lot about a character um, mm -hmm. that a rev like, acting out or, um, you know, kind of revolting against power structures mm -hmm. looks very different 
in our mm -hmm. stories than it might look um, like with a, with a character who is not from a Cuban American family or a Latinx family. Um, so it's definitely, uh, I think that kind of going back to the whole bit, this is why character and plot are linked, right? Mm -hmm. Because the decisions that she that they are making mm -hmm. are completely determined by character and what right. they're working with. Exactly. I think to to go back again to get back to Chris's question more specifically, um, I think again we're when we're comparing sort of adult and kid lit, right? They're not just they're not genres, mm -hmm. right? They're like we keep saying they are audiences, yeah. right? And so a a a, a, a horror novel or a thriller or a romance is going to be very heavy on plot. It's going to be very heavy mm -hmm. on plot, but there aren't but and there are sort of literary novels that, that just meander and, and you come to the end and you've had this cathartic moment and you feel like I love that. What happened though? But I don't care because I loved it, right? And I think as adults we can meander in, in these ways. I think for the most part, children's books aren't really going to do that that thing, right? There is a, a story there that you're mm -hmm. offering to to children that they that they can follow, right? In the way that that their um that their reading level um can can um take in yeah right in a way that makes sense but i think there are exceptions to that right so you look at all the wonderful verse novels mm -hmm. yeah and i think they're fantastic and and they are linear right for the most part they're linear but they really are kind of meandering you know kind of stories so if you think about brown girl dreaming which is memoir it kind of goes goes into her life but then it goes you know back into her family's you know past mm -hmm. right a historical past and then back to the present um, and it does, it doesn't feel like it's a plot, yeah. right? And so, so I think there are some examples in Kid Lit that, that, that are not plot heavy, that are doing the same kinds of things that adult books do. Yeah. Though I would, I think, concede that in general, right. yeah. books for kids are, are a little bit more, um, attention is more, the plot is tighter, if that makes sense, right? It's a little yeah. tighter than you see in, in some adult books. I think so. And I think it's such a cool thing to learn while like as someone mm -hmm. who like in both I, I definitely think that it's probably something I'll take to my next adult project. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's like uh, I kept thinking as I was writing running, I just kept thinking of how when you read a book to a child often and even as kids, like I remember always asking, and then what happened? And then mm -hmm. what happened? And then what happened? So I just right. I had to think like, okay, yeah, something has to happen. It can't just like occur to yeah. my character. Right. Um so I it's actually kind of ruined me in some ways. My last two adult books, I knew the ending before I even started. Oh, wow. Like I just knew the ending. And so both those were very kind of pleasant writing experiences. Mm -hmm. And I knew how Muse Squad was going to end too. And so that's been great. And I've been, so I've got these other projects that are sort of all sort of halfway done. And the problem is I don't know the ending to any of them. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, and my books that came before then, I was doing that sort of, was it pantsing versus plotting okay I, was, I mean i pants my way through it and i got to the end and it was eventually you know fine but like new plot me <laughs> <laughs> like i struggle if i don't know how, how it's gonna end as yeah. well I mean, both, both will work but it's 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 been so pleasant mm -hmm. to have a stronger sense of plot yeah for me personally yeah no i, I agree yeah you want to take another questions? question yeah uh let's see Shall we read Miriam's? She asked a long question. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate how both of you mentioned moments with characters growing as individuals, building on who they are and kind of viewing their parents and cultures in a new light. It's something I would have loved to read when I was younger, since most of the stuff I read or was assigned to me at that time felt more about, felt, wait, I'm sorry, I lost it. Felt more about the plot than the characters, if that makes sense. Like so much of the traits and character arcs felt very similar in different stories. As why lit is growing in representation, including more genres, I'm glad there are more options for kids now. So more of a comment mm -hmm. than a question. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, have you felt, um, Natalia, there's been an evolution in YA in terms of the kinds of stories we're seeing? I think so, for sure. And I think, um, I mean, it's definitely completely different from when I was reading YA, you know, when I was, actually, and I do think, was why even really such a named category when we were younger, you not know, really. uh, not really at all. So it's, it's something that I didn't realize that I was missing when I was mm -hmm. younger. And, and though I certainly found a lot I could relate to when I was younger, um, there's a reason why when I first started writing stories as a kid, I only wrote about white characters because I thought that's what real stories are written about. Right. 
Yeah. So yeah, and it's it's so many people tell me that. Like we all share that in common so often. Yeah. Um, so. And it still happens. I teach undergrads, mm -hmm. and um, we have um, we have a really diverse faculty at the University of Miami, and so our majors who um, come to creative writing tend to be very diverse themselves, and they're coming from you know all over the world, um, and they so many of them will just be like, and here are my my white girl, my white boy, and mm -hmm. they're doing that thing, and it's because these are the stories that they've read, like this is what they see yeah. between the covers. And if it's between the covers, it's good. And that's what I'm gonna tell you. And yeah. I, I, every semester I have to have that conversation with yeah. either one student, two or the entire class. Like, listen, yeah. your stories are, are valuable. Your stories are worthy, right? Yeah, Evelina yeah. did that for me. Evelina did that Yeah, she, she opened it to the one. She, yeah. She's, uh, Evelina Galang taught, was my mentor at the University of Miami, Miami when I was an undergrad creative writing major there. And yeah, um, and I came to her, um, you know, I had taken several of her fiction classes. And when I asked her to be my thesis mentor, I brought like an idea to her and she just really was like, why, why do you want to write this story? And she asked me about my own, like my own family, my own story, my own history. And it was really the first time I thought like, how come I'm not writing about that? Right. So I'm endlessly grateful to her it's, for that. Yeah. I think we all have our, that story, mm -hmm. you know, like, or that, that moment for me, it wasn't mm -hmm. a teacher. Um, I had no teachers of color um, who taught writing ever and um, in my entire sort of career mm -hmm. or like as a student. But I remember, remember, I've told this story many times before. So forgive me if anyone watching has heard it, but I love this story. So back when the malls used to have bookstores in them, do you remember Walden mm -hmm. books, yes. and Dalton books? Yeah. <laughs> um, I went to the book to the mall in Hialeah, Westland Mall, and there was like either a Walden or a Dalton. And I walked in and there was this beautiful book sitting on a shelf in the new releases in paperback. And it was Christina Garcia's wow. Dreaming in Cuban. And do you know that book that is like the face is like this with the yes. high biscuit, yeah. right? Like that one, like a gorgeous cover with the cigar band, the cigar mm -hmm. box band. Like, and now we look and we think that's cliches, but at the time, right. Um, and I remember just kind of staggering towards it. And I was in, co I was in college mm -hmm. and my first thought was who let her do this? That was my first oh my thought. God. Like, who gave her permission to write a story that's called Dreaming in Cuba? Yeah. Like, not like angry, just like. Right, right. Right. Wow. And, and I remember yeah. picking it up and seeing, seeing Spanish in it and like mm -hmm. my abuela this and blah, 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 that. And I bought it. And it was just like Emily Dickinson, right? The top of my head blew off. Mm -hmm. And I, I hadn't read anyone. I hadn't read any Latino writers. None, except for Jose Martí as a little girl, yeah. because my grandmother used to make me memorize his poems, um, but none. So I'm in my 20s, oh my and God. I read Cristina Garcia, and I'm like, next, Julia Álvarez, next, yeah. Sandra Cisneros, next, Márquez, next, you know what I mean? And it just became like, I just sort of binge them all. And so I always say that these are the writers who, who, yeah. who had laid down pavement. They'd been laying it down, and I just didn't know where it was. Yeah. You know, and, and I feel, I feel so much gratitude um, for sort of the expansion of diverse voices in literature yeah. and that kids can see themselves in lots of different books, mm -hmm. you know, that, that, that we no longer have a generation that can say, I don't see myself Yeah, because we've got books from all kinds of cultures. We've got books about kids who are trans. We've got kids about, you know, books about like menstruation, like Aida mm -hmm. Salazar's, you yeah. know, the moon within, I mean, I mean, have all these amazing stories that are out there and that not just that they're out there but there are sort of these beautiful searchlights mm -hmm. pointing at them you know yeah. for the first time and so yeah. um but that's Absolutely. yeah that's my story it was I, love that. yeah. I have the i have a dream in cuban story too you and do. i'll tell you really quickly but because yeah. before when i was with you know i was taking evelina's fiction classes mm -hmm. like i told you but i was actually a poetry major before i switched. like mm -hmm. my concentration was in poetry mm -hmm. and the day after i finished dreaming in cuban i went to her class and i told her i want to learn to do this because I never want to leave these characters. Mm -hmm. And so, and she gave me a high five because she was like, yes, you're coming over to fiction. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah. That's so. wonderful. When I met her for the first time was at AWP and um, I was holding my copy of Jimmy and Cuban and I, I went to a panel she was on about like hiring visiting writers. I mean, I wasn't even interested in it at all. I just went because mm -hmm. she was on it. And I waited for after afterwards and I said, oh, hi. Um, my name is Chantal Acevedo, and she had looked at my name tag, and I'd had already two books out at that point. And she was like, I know who you are. And then I started crying. Like, and then I just started crying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because, like, here was, like, my hero and my mentor, you know. Yeah, of um, course. Like, acknowledging me, and she signed my book, and it's, like, a treasured possession. And wow. she's just very dear to me.
Yeah, no, she really is. is. Nice. We love yeah. her. Yeah. yeah. Um, I wanted before we go into questions, mm -hmm. real uh, back into questions, real quick. I did want to talk a little bit about because um, I know we covered like craft and marketing mm -hmm. or um, publishing or you know the publishing side of it, kind of. Mm -hmm. But um, do you have any thoughts in terms of like now that we're out, we're both marketing and promoting our books? Like, do you mm -hmm. feel it's different? Um, and you know, in yes. what ways? I think so. Yeah. I think so. I feel like, I don't know. I feel like I'm going to get in trouble saying this, but I, I also feel like right away in Kidlit, there was like this kind of immediate community mm -hmm. of other, other Kidlit writers. Right. And so for example, Las Musas is such a beautiful group of uh, Latinx writers who identify as women and so supportive. Um, and those of you who are watching can, can't even imagine how supportive, yeah. really, like just be, and beyond publishing and marketing. Um, and that was kind of, in, that happened almost right away, you know? Um, and I feel like kid lit writers cheer each other on a lot mm -hmm. online, whereas writing for adults feels a little bit more isolated and mm -hmm. not necessarily competitive, right? right? But sort of just a little bit more isolated and, and sort of your your work is, is just yours, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and your readers are your community, and you speak to them directly, you know, as as best you can. But I feel like there is a a, a greater sense of we're all in this together. Yeah, kidlit. Not to get all High School Musical. Mm -hmm. No, but I get that because yeah. I think I didn't notice that at first um, mm -hmm. because I was really my first two adult books were published by an imprint that was pretty new and incredibly diverse, and mm -hmm. so a lot of the authors who I feel like were my first community were we shared either a publisher or an editor in common yeah. and so we really came together around that mm -hmm. but then outside of that um it used to be that when people would say oh you know there's not a strong community in kidlet i'd be like that's not true i have so many mm -hmm. author friends and then i'd realize that like, most of them were ya authors <laughs> and i wasn't even writing ya yet it was just mm -hmm. that i had kind of gravitated to that yeah. um as Same. a reader and therefore being a reader when i would go to festivals these were the authors i'd end up hanging out with mm -hmm. um, and so yeah it's funny when I finally when I did sell running I was so excited to tell my YA other friends like I was like I get to sit at your table now like yes. it is kind of like yeah, yeah, yeah. with the fun kids right <laughs> yeah yeah I mean yeah I have a, I have friends who are you know writers many friends who are writers who write for adults exclusively and and, and they're lovely human beings and I'm glad mm -hmm. they're in my lives but what is actually really interesting because I, I lived in Auburn Alabama uh, for nine years, and um, I taught at Auburn University. And my first writer friends were um, were YA writers. It was mm -hmm. Rachel Hawkins and Ash Parsons. And Rachel's book was Hex Hall, which is her very first book, was coming out at the same time as um, I want to say Love and Ghosts. That was my first book. So we we sort of started mm -hmm. that sort of writer track together. And she was very firmly in the YA world, and I was in the adult world. Um, but but yeah, she was like my first like writer, writer friend. You know what I mean? Like first true, true writer friend. And yeah. it just like you, it felt it felt very good to finally be like, Rachel, Ashley, yeah. I get to be on your team. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit, you know? Um but yeah, just very, very supportive. Again, mm -hmm. not not dissing the adult world. It just feels a little more sort of independent. Yeah. It just feels more a little more independent. Like we're part more of a web, you know, in Kidlet. Right. It's more of a web. Yeah. I want. I love this question from Sheila, which is: Is there room for Latinx writers to write about Latinx characters just being themselves, or mm -hmm. like mainstream writers, so white? Um, or is there an expectation that we write the struggle, mm -hmm. which is it's it's a conversation we've been continuously having. I feel, and also in adult books as well. Um, but I will say that this is why I loved writing um, running so much. Is that mm -hmm. you know, um, Maddie is the daughter of a Cuban American senator who's running for president. <laughs> you know, there the historically that hasn't happened a lot, right? Um, so you know, she does have a lot of struggles that probably any other um any other daughter of a person in power would have, but mm -hmm. a lot of them are also unique to her. Yeah. Um, and I think it's so important that we don't only write the struggle because I think then when we are, we're only writing the struggle, we're kind of um, erasing our characters' full humanity and the richness of their experiences. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that we've talked a lot about that in terms of like, you know, writing towards the white gaze. And I think that kind of going to another question somebody was saying is that do you have to seek out um, diverse stories in order to um, 
to help you with your own literary foundation, which was what Moon was asking. And I think absolutely, because sometimes you can't name what you've been doing until you see what the possibilities outside of it are. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that applies so much to writing for the white gaze. It's mm -hmm. like once you can, once you start writing work that isn't, um, it's just, it feels very transformative and um, empowering. And and it's almost like, for me anyways, it's like, it's once you see the, un, the what you can't unsee what you've seen, mm -hmm. right? So it changes mm -hmm. everything. Yeah. I, yeah, I agree. I think I think there's progress being made, but I think it's really slow. Mm -hmm. I think it's I think that um, it's moving faster in Kidlit. Is my yeah, sense of I agree. This, you know, I never got the note that said make Cali more poor, or make right. Cali more. You know what I mean? Or, yeah. or whatever that stereotype is about her. Like I never ever ever got that note. You know. Mm -hmm. Um. But in the, and and my last two books have been sort of 19th century adult books have been 19th century historicals but before that I with other books yeah definitely right mm -hmm. and com and comparisons to other books and other sort of Latinx cultures are were nothing like mine right yeah. so very early on and again I think these things aren't aren't so much happening anymore but very early on comparisons to like Juno Diaz right mm -hmm. and so like his character's experiences in Patterson New Jersey or were not my character's experiences in Miami, but because yeah. we both had Spanish surnames, they were conflated, right. they were the same, and, and one of us was doing it wrong, right? Yeah. Um, and so and so, I think Latinx writers have struggled with that a lot, a mm -hmm. lot, and I think continue to. And like I said, I, I feel like Kid Lit's a little bit more open to it. Yeah. And I think we only need to look to American Dirt to see how yeah. there's an appetite for that struggle, you know, among, among a lot of readers, that white gaze that you're talking yeah. about. Um, that I think writers need to work against. Yeah, right. and I think it's I I yeah. I do find the more we all like I think of it as the more we all push against it, the less someone else coming it, coming up will have to deal with it. Right. You know, so it's it's as exhausting as it can be for us because it right. is it's emotionally draining and mm -hmm. it's a lot of um, at least for me sometimes there's all this self doubt that comes into it. Like when you come across a moment where you think, Hey, actually, I don't want to do this or, you know, mm -hmm. and then you think, wait, but am I, am I being difficult or am I being, you know, am I making too big of a deal out of it? And then mm -hmm. you, when you think it through, at least I'm like, yeah, but I can't, I can't support that final decision. Mm -hmm. So you have to really yeah. kind of push back. Right. Um, and of course, stories of struggle are important and they need to yeah. continue to be told right. in, in ways that are beautiful and yeah. nuanced and um, poignant. Um, but stories of joy are also super yeah. important too. So we just need yeah. to make room for, for all of those, all of those experiences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I say this as someone like my previous book is an immigration story and there is certainly a lot of struggle because that is the reality. But what, um, you know, the thing is that I felt wasn't being seen enough was actually the like strength and beauty and joy and like mm -hmm. you know, just simple everyday moments of humor. Like, nothing, mm -hmm. life doesn't only exist through this one lens and none of us actually experience our life like walking around thinking, I'm Latinx, therefore I'm struggling. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> you know, like right. it's not like always in our minds. Like there is a way that I think um, things just become, there's a balance between the extraordinary and the ordinary mm -hmm. and that looks different for each person. Right. And if you can honor that and express that truthfully, mm -hmm. then um, I think that's, that's what um, I think that's what we mean when we, when we talk about not just doing struggle, right. Yeah. Not making it like up for consumption or, yeah. um, you know, kind of this voyeuristic gaze that we've spoken about previously. Yeah, exactly. And I think too, that there are, oftentimes when people say, well, that's a universal concern, what they mean is a, it's a white concern, mm -hmm. that yeah. that's universal, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and, I, and I'm thinking of both of our uh, books, both have an environmental angle to them. Mm -hmm. They both yeah. do, um, because Callie has to sort of inspire her classmate who is just big on the environment, right? And she wants to save the world. Um, and, and, and she wants to stop global warming and, you know, climate change. And your your character, Mari, mm -hmm. discovers an environmental passion, right? These are issues that are not just, you know, white people issues or Latinx issues. Those are mm -hmm. universal issues. This is a global issue. Mm -hmm. um, and so allowing our characters the room and the space to to worry about those things, yeah. you know, I think is important. Too. Yeah. Let's find some more. We're coming to the last five minutes. Yeah. Last five minutes, you guys. Um, Natalia, the question. Um, what? Not that, I'll let Natalia pick a question. Oh. So Ashley was piggybacking off of Sheila 
How Latinx do I have to make my characters? I did not grow up with Spanish, but I am Mexican, and so are all of my characters, but I feel like they are Latinx enough. Mm. Um, so I think that we have to, um, I hope that you will write the story true to your experience because um, you know the more stories that actually fully encompass the breadth of what it really means um, to to be Latinx, if that's the term that you prefer, then then we'll actually see the like. There's I don't think there's any such thing as Latinx enough. Like we get to define it through our own lived experiences, right? Um, and the only difference is that some experiences are more represented on the page than others. So. Um, and also, I think, I mean, I don't know, do, what, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I mean, I, I they are Latinx enough. I mean, yeah. They are, right? Yeah. Like, they are, you know, you identify with, you self-identify, you know, mm -hmm. and like, I feel strongly about this, you know, my kids, my kids don't speak Spanish. And um, I do, I do. It's like, well, the one kind of parenting regret I have, you know, they were growing up in Alabama, and they didn't hear it ever. And so we got lazy with it. And my husband and I communicate in English. Though we're both fluent in Spanish, and so now my kids are like, like the gringo kids here in Miami. <laughs> um, but that's still a valid experience, right? They're mm -hmm. still Latinx enough, though yeah. they might not have the language. You know what I mean? But they have other. There are other things in their lives that that speak to their culture and 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 ways that they are unique. You know, from from other kids. So yeah someone needs to write that book so that mm -hmm. my kids can read it <laughs> you know <laughs> so ashley please write that book so that my kids can read it mm -hmm. um because it, it'll be important for them and, and they aren't definitely aren't the only ones they definitely are yeah yeah please do yeah, absolutely yeah do you want to pick um our last couple of questions like where what are how are we doing on time yeah we probably have room for like one more question one right? more question uh let's see We've got, how about, well, there's a simple one about writing process. Oh, Eileen's yeah. got a simple one there about how, can you speak about your writing process? How long did it take you to publish? So two different questions. Ooh. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's see. I always answer the writing process questions question on, two, on one condition, which is that you don't compare mine to yours. Mm -hmm. uh, because there is no right right or wrong way to do it and in fact it changes completely not just from book to book for me but even just from like month to month or I, I really think in ju just in terms of like time in my life like my writing process right now under everything we're going through right now actually is varying so much even from like week to week like last week I was in the flow and then this week I'm kind of like mm, but I know I'll get back to it um, so honestly like my writing process usually I, I, I would say I don't average more than when I'm in when I'm in like a drafting mode um, I don't actually um, I, I try to write every day but I, I would say I'd average writing maybe four to five days a week I let myself take weekends, whether it's on an actual weekend or where it's, you know, break. Mm -hmm. um, because I think that when I treat writing like part of my, what like a job that I'm more um, inclined to like stay consistent in it. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I, and for me, like a really good writing session is probably like anywhere from 800 to 1500 words. Like after that, I'm like emotionally exhausted. Mm -hmm. um, and I also often, rewrite like I'm a big big rewriter like I'm writing a new story right now and I must have written like at least 20 or 30 pages and with four different opening scenes that I just scratched soon after I wrote them because I wrote and then I was like nope that wasn't it that's not how I'm getting into the story and then I wrote again and I was like nope that's not the entry into the story either and so it's really just um I think a real writing process is about is about really just being honest with yourself and kind of learning to become attuned to the differences in your own um in 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 how you where you are right in this moment of um is this am i writing am i not writing out of fear am i not writing out of procrastination am i pushing it against the things that um that are hard in order to get to, to realize that maybe there's something really important behind that fear all that and so it's like for me the writing process is just a constant conversation and really of just listening to myself yeah and how long did it take you to get published oh sorry That's another um, question whew. For my first book or anything so i actually um my first book i wrote i didn't publish it i worked like five i, I worked anywhere from five to seven years and i say that because i kind of worked on two books at the same time um, but the first book i got my agent with took me about five years and it never sold mm -hmm. and then um i wrote chasing the sun which i had actually written as my undergrad thesis at the university of miami and i took that out of a drawer dusted it off rewrote it again 
started it over from like almost nothing um, to it took that took about two years and, and then it was published you know so um, but both my last two books have taken about two and a half years mm. yeah how about you yeah for me my process is um I think I just think of it in stages like mm -hmm. there's the sort of just the thinking about it process which sometimes can take yeah. all, like like years mm -hmm. and so part of what I've done is um, respecting that that is actually a process sometimes just yeah. not actually writing is part of your process and just thinking about it especially as i like i said i've come to wanting like i need to know the ending you know mm -hmm. before i begin so so that's part of my process like you i don't think i can do more than about 1500 words that, that's my max and i start mm -hmm. to then i just start to feel like i'm typing with my elbows you know what i mean it's, it's yeah. just everything hurts at that point um and, and once the story really gets going then um i feel like i can you know, come to it pretty, pretty frequently, you know, like mm -hmm. I, for me, the longest part is the thinking about a stage. That's the thinking about a stage. Once yeah, I know right. like, this is how it ends. This is how it goes. I'll take, like, it'll take me a year to draft it. That's amazing. You know I mean? Like it's yeah. a year to draft it, a year to edit it. And then it's out. Right. That's so cool. I love that you're honoring that part of it. Cause it's, I think so. We so rarely hear about that part of it. Yeah. It's just, and it's thinking, so true. Thinking. And you yeah. have to kind of train yourself to think about it as mm -hmm. well. You know what I mean? And, and we all, you know, you, you know, you have the whole cliche about like, I'm doing dishes and, mm -hmm. and I'm spinning out, but oftentimes you don't, you know, like you're thinking about the, the dishes or mm -hmm. an email you have to write or whatever. So also making space in your brain for like, now it's just time to think about just to imagine and daydream the way we did when we were kids. Yeah, that's um, true. And, and that's sort of the way to solve the problems in the story as well. But that's my process. Yeah. And as for like, that. And, and as for how long things took to get published, Love and Ghost Letters was my first novel, and it was my, my master's thesis, my MFA thesis. And I wrote it, and it didn't get published for another six years. Wow. So I had one agent who couldn't sell it, um, and then changed agents, and she was able to sell it. Um, I have another book that never sold. It's terrible. It's about Hemingway. Um, I have <laughs> um, A Falling Star Took Forever to, to, to Sell as well. And then other books like the Europa books were very quick. So mm -hmm. that's another thing you have to, I yeah. think, uh, get rid of expectations, right? Every book is going to have its own path, its own process. Some of them are going super fast and some will be slow. Yeah. Um, but you're always still writing and you're always still thinking of story and it's always forward motion Yeah, in some way. So I have to get hung <laughs> up on benchmarks, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. Benchmarks. Yeah. So. So we should um, probably wrap up, yeah, right? Yeah, I think so. And yeah. actually, I was going to say, if anybody um, has a question that we didn't get to, please feel free to tweet them to us. Um, I'm at, at Natalia Silv on Twitter. And wait, Chantal, is, do you have a Chantal Acevedo. Oh, Chantal Acevedo. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, we'll try to get to them. And we will be selecting winners of our um, book swag, and we'll be emailing the five winners each, so after this um, conference. So. Yes. So you'll get an email if you are selected. It's a random number generator that Natalia found. Mm -hmm. Also, we've been toggling back and forth on the offers between running and Muse Squad. So please do pre-order the books. It helps us. It tells the publisher that people are excited about these books. Mm -hmm. And also, if you pre-order from an indie bookstore like Books and Books, you're yeah. helping to support a bookstore. And I also toggle the most the, the latest offer that you see here is uh, the next Las Musas webinar, and that is an Own Voices World Building webinar, turning real life experience into fantasy craft insight with a live Q&A with two beautiful Musa authors um, and that is going to be happening tomorrow wow. so that's free so if you enjoyed this um, tune in and I believe these get recorded so um, yeah. you can also tell a friend if if they missed it yeah okay awesome thank you so much bye. Antel. it was awesome talking thank to you thank you Natalia yeah and thank you everyone for joining us okay. we'll bye 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 everyone bye <laughs>